اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین و صلی اللہ علی سیدنا و حبیبنا حبیب الہ العالمین محمد و علی آلہ الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین المنتجبین We discussed about Lisan al-Sadq last night and the fulfillment of the dua of Ibrahim salam when he asked about Lisan al-Sadq, when he pleaded to the Lord, وَجْعَلْ لِي لِسَانَ صِدْقٍ فِي الْآخِرِينَ Put for me an honest tongue in future generations. And as We related this to Surah Zukhruf, where Allah says about the pure belief of Ibrahim being perpetuated in his progeny, وَجَعَلَهَا كَلِمَةً بَاقِيَةً فِي عَقِبِهِ This we made a perpetual belief, idea, in his progeny. Therefore, in every generation, there should be a lisan set, an honest tongue. Honest tongue needs, first of all, absolute knowledge of the message of Ibrahim. Otherwise, he would misguide people. And therefore, he needs a knowledge which is in nature the same as the knowledge of Ibrahim himself. So whatever we say about Ibrahim and the nature of his knowledge, that lesson is said or the honest tongue should have that type of knowledge as well. And then a sincerity, which would provide for the type of soul which can convey that message to the people. And also, of course, uh, to have brave courage to communicate to the people to that message. That message. Now, what I would like to do tonight and uh, in the couple of nights which follows to is to have an assessment of uh, what happened uh, in early time of Muslim history which led to this catastrophic incident of the martyrdom of Hussein alayhi salam. As I have repeatedly mentioned, this is not an easy thing that the grandson of the Prophet, the most honorable Muslims, is killed in that brutal way with, along with his family, and uh, the Ummah is not moved. And everyone knew that it was wrong. That is the problem. If they thought that they were doing the right thing, then we would have analyzed it in a different way. Everyone knew that it was a wrong thing, but the Muslim Ummah kept quiet. Now, then we have to doubt about these traditions which are mentioned, which are reported from the Prophet that La tajtamu ummati ala khata and my ummah never concur on a mistake. Of course, there were many, many Muslims who denied that, who defied that, rejected the idea, and therefore there was no concurrence, but majority of the ummah kept quiet about it. What happened? So we have to have an analysis. I, as I said, I'm not going to go far To, uh, to the very, very early times after the Prophet, I want to uh, start analyzing from the time of the honest tongue, Ali, peace be on him. When he... When the honest tongue started to speak. Now, when we are going through the uh, statements of the honest tongue, of Ibrahim, the honest tongue of the Prophet, peace be on him, we see that the situation is very grim, even more, uh, even darker than what we can imagine. Because the honest tongue doesn't just see the, 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 the appearance, the apparent face of Muslims Okay, everyone is praying, everyone is fasting, everyone is saying, la ilaha illallah, everything is good, happy days. The honest tongue doesn't look at this. The honest tongue looks deep into the heart of the people and into 
the diseases which would develop into cancerous type of ailments in future. Now, a few statements from Amir al and then some analysis about what happened which the Ummah came to this position and situation. When Amir al was given bay'ah in Medina, this is sermon number 16 from Nahjul Balagha. Of course, some may doubt the statements in Nahjul Balagha because they say this was compiled by Sharif al Radi, Rahmatullah Alai. There is no chain of transmission for this. However, uh, other scholars have actually uh, compiled a mustakhraj for this book, and that is the book which contains all the asnat, chains of transmission, which Sharif al-Razi has omitted and has decided not to mention. So it's not only in this book. These tr statements that I'm going to mention can be found in many other books with chains of transmission, Sunni and Shi'i, because this, re this is related to history rather than to aqidah and belief. Now, Sharif al-Razi says, من كلام له عليه السلام لما بويع في المدينة when he was given بيع in مدينة and of course people came to him they wanted to give him allegiance he said I do not accept unless this is in front of everyone and everyone agrees with it and accepts it because he knew that some are going to somehow renege later on and take back their allegiance like Talha and Zubair. So he wanted this to be quite clear, apparent, everyone agreeing. So when he was given this bay'ah, he made a short statement and he set out his plans and he said, what I am going to do? I'm not going to behave the same way my predecessors behaved. And why he says this? Because he is actually detecting, he is diagnosing a disease in the Ummah. He says that Allah, of course, I'm just taking the, the sentence which is related to my topic. Allah wa inna baliyatakum qad adat kahayataha yawma ba'athallah nabiyahu sallallahu alayhi wa your disease, your ailment has come back the way it was at the time of the birth of the Prophet. You are no different. How are we no different? We have made lots of jihad. We are praying, we are fasting, we are saying, La ilaha illallah. Why are we no different? Well, of course, things have changed in this way, but the hearts are inclined towards the same things as it was before, towards asabiyya, asabiyyatul jahiliya, prejudice, proud, arrogance, and all these things. These are the things that this lisan is seeing in the ummah. And it is actually conveying to them that although the, the apparent uh, face of the ummah is very nice, everyone is saying la ilaha illallah, but Allah is not deceived by words. In a sermon uh, which is called Al Qasi'ah, which I will mention a, a couple of statements from it, Amirul Mu'minin says that, do you think if Allah expelled Iblis from his proximity, from his qurb, because of arrogance, is he going to allow you in that place with arrogance? Is Allah discriminating between anyone? And there he says, if Allah has judged about a malak, about an angel, because of course there's dispute whether Iblis was an angel or a jinn. Anyhow, it was a jinn which became, I mean, to combine all uh, views, he was a jinn which was brought to the station of angels. And Allah says, if an angel is expelled from the vicinity of God because of arrogance. Do you think you will be allowed there with arrogance? And this is what he is actually diagnosing in the Ummah. That now arrogance has come. The 
wealth is pouring towards the center of the Muslim power from everywhere, from every quarter, and this has made people to change. They are not the type of loyal, sacrificial sort of companions that they were for the Prophet. So he says, Allah wa inna baliyatakum qad adat ka hayataha yawma ba'athallahu nabiyyah. Your disease has come back the same way it was at the time of the Prophet, peace be on him. And then, of course, he says, uh, I know what to do. I'm going to save you, to shake you, and I'm going to change everything upside down. And this is, of course, maybe this was not nice from a politician to, to, to say at the beginning of his mandate. Because then people would have started to say, wow, what type of leader is this? He's not going to give us anything, any special share from Beitul Mal that Uthman was, going to, was giving us, Umar ibn al-Khattab was giving us. You know that this is clear, this is not something which, which is related to Aqidah. It's clear that the Arabs were given preference over Ajam at the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And then at the time of Uthman, others were given preference as I said, this is not concerned to Aqidah, it's concerned to the, it's related in the history. So he says, I'm going to change all this. I'm going to somehow uh, change things in a way that when a stew is boiling in the uh, in the big pot, how things are going to change places, I'm going to do it to do like that with you. So, when he made such a statement, of course, everyone were taken aback. We have given allegiance to this man, and this man is not going to keep any regards for any position, for any uh, priority, preference, Arab over Ajam, Muhajirun over Ansar, Muhajirun and Ansar over others. Everyone is seen equal in his eyes. Why? Because he is the honest tongue. And honest tongue is bitter. Now, I'm not actually uh, discussing the, the style and method of Amir al-Mu'mineen's rule and the way he treated people. What I am actually trying to say that is that he diagnosed something very bad in the Ummah. And he said, I'm going to change this. Then the discussion that we had in the past few nights, that is there a difference between Muslim Ummah and other Ummahs, between Muslims and Christians, Muslims and Jews, Muslims and Buddhists, in the sense that because we are Muslims, many things, many mistakes that we do, many sins that we commit is forgiven. Allah should always support us, always should support us because we are Muslims, because we, we testify to the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in a way discriminate between us and other nations. Now, Amir al mumin very clearly says that this is not the case. Allah doesn't look at names. Allah looks at realities. Why Muslims have lost their glory? Sometimes we... I'm amazed. We think that Muslims should always have glory no matter what they do. No matter what they have, their history has been. And I wonder, I would have actually imagined a bigger punishment for Muslims for killing Hussein salam than what has happened in the history. I mean, we have done all these things. And then we say, God, why don't we are Muslims? Why don't you help us? You have given us the, uh, the promise of support. Now, this honest tongue is very, very clearly mentioning that do not expect help from God. Oh, Muslims, do not expect help from God if you are fighting for your own ambitions. Allah supports those who fight for his sake, not for those who fight for their ambitions. There is a khutbah in Nahjul Balagh, as I mentioned. 
which is called Khutbatul Qasa. The Qasa means the Khutbah which really hits the hearts. And in that it talks about the, the disease of the Ummah after he came to power, of course, and after he was faced with su such a resistance. He says that, I فَأَتَبِرُوا بَهَالِ وَلْدِ إِسْمَائِيلِ وَبَنِي إِسْحَاقِ وَبَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ فَمَا أَشَدَّ أَتِدَادَ الْإِعْتِدَالَ الْأَحْوَالِ وَأَقْرَبَ إِشْتِبَاهَ الْأَمْثَالِ Look into the history and the story of descendants of Ismail, Ishaq, and Israel, Banu Israel. And this is what I said. فَمَا أَشَدَّ اِعْتِدَالَ الْأَحْوَالِ How similar are the situations. وَأَخْرَبَ اِشْتِبَاهَ الْأَمْطَالِ How close are the examples. You are actually going down that route and you have to expect the same thing that Allah did to them. You have to expect the same thing. وَأَلَمُوا I said this seems to be very grim. But just, just listen to this honest tongue. I don't want you to judge it. It's very bitter. This is very bitter. What Amir al-Mu'min is talking about the Ummah. وَأَلَمُوا أَنَّكُمْ سِرْتُمْ بَعْدَ الْهِجْرَةِ أَعْرَابًا You were muhajirun. You made hijrah. Now you have become Bedouins again. بَعْدَ الْهِجْرَةِ أَعْرَابًا Because Arab ordered to migrate to to Medina, now you have changed. You have completely retracted. After you were having the walaya of one God and one prophet, now you have become different groups, different parties. You do not hang to Islam on but to its name. وَلَا تَعْرِفُونَ مِنَ الْإِيمَانِ إِلَّا رَسْمَةِ You know nothing of faith but its definition. And this is not enough. As I said, this is very bitter. This is very harsh. But he is the honest tongue. He has to speak this way. Now that he has... Of course, at the time of the caliphs, he didn't speak. And he did not disobey. This is very important. I will give you one example that once Osman, Osman summoned him and he said that you have disobeyed me. He said, no, I have not disobeyed you. This is the meaning of what I did. He did not want to create any trouble, any problem because of the unity of the ummah. And this is a lesson we have to learn from Amir al salam. But when he came to power, he had to speak because now he had the responsibility of directing the Ummah. So he says, you do not hang to Islam but to its name and don't know anything of faith but its definition. Wow. You say, hell is better than disgrace. Then we are somehow preferred over by some other tribe, that that tribe or that party or that uh, group would be better than us, overwhelm us, or we never accept, or we never accept, disgrace we never accept, hell we accept. Is this the way a Muslim should talk? And this shows the Muslims had gone too far now. They had gone too far. You remember what Imam Hussein alayhi salam <laughs> recited when he was going to the, he himself was going to fight. He said, Al Maut, Awla, Min Rukub al Ari, Wal Ar, Awla, Min Dukhul al Nari. Death is better than disgrace. And disgrace is better than fire of hell. Now here they say exactly the opposite. Fire of hell is better than disgrace. This is prejudice. We are not going to accept. This is asabiyya. Anyone, anything which would disgrace us in their own mentality. Even hell fire is better. I don't know how this motto, this slogan had spread. 
But this is something which had spread to the extent that Amirul Mu'mineen in his sermon is saying that this is your slogan. You say Al-Ar wal An-Nar. An-Nar wal Al-Ar. Fire of hell, yes. Disgrace, no. This is tribal asabiyya. Ka'annakum turiduna an tukful Islam ala wajhihi. You want to turn Islam upside down. And then, this is what I, I meant to mention from his khutbah. وَإِنَّكُمْ إِنْ لَجَأْتُمْ إِلَىٰ غَيْرِهِ If you come out of the true faith, not the appearance of the faith, not just on the tongue, in the heart, if you come out of it, أَهْلُ الْكُفْرِ Okay, other nations will come and fight you. Now, ponder on this, what has happened in Islam. Because this has perplexed many people. Why Muslims have lost their glory? Look what the honest tongue is saying. If you, in lajatum ila ghayrihi, if you seek refuge in other than true faith, harabakum ahlul kufr. The ahlul kufr will fight you. Natural. Everyone is fighting for more territory, more power. Thumma la Jibra'il, wala Mikail. وَلَا مُهَاجِرُونَ وَلَا أَنْصَارِ يَنْصُرُونَكُمْ إِلَّا الْمُقَارَعَةِ بِالسَّيْفِ حَتَّى يَحْكُمَ اللَّهُ بَيْنَكُمْ You fight, but don't accept that Jibreel and Mikael and Muhajirun and Ansar come to your help. That is for real mu'minun. That's not for those who carry the name of Islam and then attack other nations, do not have any scruples, take things to the extreme in terms of brutality and all these things and then they say, Ya Allah, why didn't you help us? Why have we lost our glory? Well, we deserved it. Because we deserved it. Because of the true faith had lost its appeal from the hearts. Then Jibreel and Mikhail and Muhajirun and Ansar would not help you. وَإِنْدَكُمْ الْأَمْثَالِ مِنْ بَعْسِ اللَّهِ وَقَوَارِهِ You have lots of examples before you. So, is there a difference between Thamud and Muslims? A difference between Ad and Muslims? A difference between Qawm of Fir'aun and Muslims? No, there is no difference. As I said before, there is no chosen nation. It's mentioned in the Bible as well. I read it somewhere, I don't remember from which prophet, who said, Allah doesn't have a chosen nation. Allah chooses nations, gives them the grace and blessing. If they deserve it, they keep it. If they don't deserve, deserve it, they lose it. And then he says, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ سُبْحَانَهُ لَمْ يَلْأَنِ الْقَرْنَ الرَّمَاضِ بَيْنَ أَيْدِيكُمْ إِلَّا لِتَرْكِهِمُ الْأَمْرَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَالنَّحْيَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ Do you know why the previous ummahs were deprived of the mercy of God? Because they abandoned Amr bil ma'roof wa nahyan al munkar and when Hussein alayhi salam actually rose to perform this duty to discharge this duty of Amr bil ma'roof and wa nahyan al munkar everyone was telling him don't do it you will be killed be careful it's dangerous so if the previous ummahs were abandoned by God, it's because they abandoned Amr bil Ma'roof wa Nahya an al Munkar. And many other things. This is khutbah number 192 of Nahjul Balagh. It's very beautiful, very moving. And then Amirul Mu'mineen mentions that. Uh, uh, Ala waqad amaranillah biqital ahl al now, of course, he's mentioning what Prophet told him. Ya Ali, you will fight al-Nakithun, wal-Qasithun, wal-Mariqun. 
And he said, I fought the Nakathun. Nakathun were those who broke the pledge. Talha and Zubair. This is what Amir al Mumin called them, Nakath. Nakathu and Bayat him. They said, in Nahjul Balagha, Amir al Mumin says that you have come to me and you say, yes, we gave you the pledge with our hands, but our hearts were not happy and therefore we want to break it. And then he says that, well, you confess to what is against you. You say that you have given the bay'ah and you bring something as, a, uh, as an argument which is not accepted from you. If you were not happy, why did you give the bay'ah? Then now that you have given the bay'ah, why do you break it? Now, some people tell us, don't investigate, don't somehow analyze these things in history. Leave that Allah would judge between them. My question is, then how should we get, where from should we get our examples? Where from should we get our true role models? If we say Nakathun, those who broke the pledge to Ali were right, good people. Ali who fought them and killed them was good people. And his followers, they were good people. Everyone, whatever they did, they were good people. So, I'm left perplexed, isn't it? What should I do? Who should I follow? Who was right? Who was wrong? This is why we need what Allah mentions to us, that look into the history of the previous people before you. Why should we just disregard everything and say that we do not want to judge then when it comes to following aqidah, which aqidah? Aqidah of Ali or aqidah of others? Which one should we follow? Because they had different versions of Sunnah of the Prophet with them. So, he said that what Prophet had said, I did. I fought the Nakathun, I fought the Qasitun, Muawiyah, and his party. And I fought the Marakun, those who actually went out of the faith by taking things to extreme calling everyone kafir and thinking they were the only one who were mu'min. I killed them as well. I fought them. And everything is now settled, just remains one thing, and that is, as he mentions, there's just one thing left. I have to finish off what is there with the issue of Muawiyah. And of course, the, the death did not allow him to fulfill that. And in this... Khutbah at the end, he mentions about his past, the days he had with the Prophet, peace be on him, how Prophet taught him things, and how, what, Prophet, what things Prophet said about him, and then people disobeying him, the honest tongue of the Prophet. Now I want to mention one example, and I want you to judge, what can we do with this history? What can we do with this history? Who should we support? Who should we follow? You may say, we have to follow Prophet Muhammad, peace be on him, no one else. But Prophet Muhammad's sunnah was reflected through these companions. And these companions claim different things. So how could we say, okay, we disregard everything and we just this is, this is zulm. This is actually oppressing, wronging the one who has the right. Again, this is history. This is not something that is related to faith or aqidah. You know, Abu Azar was one of the most trusted companions of the Prophet, peace be on him. And Prophet said that no one, no sky has ever shadowed, shaded on, and no earth has ever carried someone with a tongue as honest and as frank as the tongue of Abu Dhar. Now, Abu Dhar was unhappy about what was happening during the time of Uthman. Unhappy now, I don't want to judge, but he was unhappy because he, he saw things in the courts, which wasn't good. And he saw, then he was banished to 
Muawiyah to Sham to stay there. So because no one knew him there. And he used every morning saying to, uh, uh, every morning going to the door of the palace and shouting that may God curse those who, uh, who do munkar and then do nahi an munkar. Who leave ma'roof and do amr bil ma'roof and such things. And Muawiyah wrote to Uthman, if you want Sham, take, withdraw Abu Dhar from Sham. So Abu, Abu Zar was summoned to Medina in a very, of course, appalling way. And then Uthman decided to banish him somewhere very far. So he told him, where do you want to go? He said, I want, okay, let me go to Makkah. He said, no, Makkah is not possible. He said, let me go to one of the Masrain, Kufa and Basra. He said, that is not possible. He said, let me go to Certain, such and such place, it's, it's all mentioned here, of course, uh, I, may, uh, I may go through it quickly. He said, no, I will send you to where that you wouldn't enjoy. I send you to Rabada, where you, was born, you were born. And where he was born, of course, he hated that place because that place was a place where his parents, his family were used to worship idol, and he hated that place most. He said, I, he banished him to Rabat. When he banished him, he ordered Marwan, Marwan ibn hakam does the name strike any chord? He was the one when Hussein came to, uh, to meet the Amir of Medina, he was present. And he said, either kill him or take pledge from him now. So he sent Marwan ibn hakam to guard him and conduct him outside Medina, and he ordered no one should go and see off and talk to Abu Zar. Now, the history says, this is reported by Ibn Abul Hadid in Shah Nahjul Balagha, and he reports it from Abdul Razak, from Akrama, from Abdullah ibn Abbas. Of course, uh, Sharif al Razi has, has his own chains. But Abdul Razak ibn Abdul Hadid reports him from him. He says, when he was going outside, Ali, peace be on him, Aqil, Hassanain alayhim salam and Ammar came to visit him and to see him off. So Hassan alayhi salam went forward and started to talk him, with him. Marwan said, this is forbidden. You have to go away because Abu Zar, no one should talk to him. Amir al was very angry. He pushed Marwan back and he said that, why shouldn't we talk to, uh, to Abu Zar, the companion of the Prophet? And of course, Marwan went and complained to Uthman, but then there was a conversation. Every person there started to talk to Abu Zar. This is what Amir al said to Abu Zar. I think we have to read between the lines. This is very important. Ya Abu Zar, innaka ghadibta lillah. You, your anger was aroused because of God. Now, what did Abu Zar see that his anger was aroused? What was it that he was so upset about that he could not stop criticizing to the extent that he had to be banished. Ya Abu Adar, inna ka qadibta lillah, farju man qadibta lah. So place your hope in the one for whom you had your, you showed your anger. Inna al qawma khafu ka ala dunyahum wa khiftahum ala dinik. These people were afraid of you because of their dunya. Who are these people? These were the Muslims. Now, Amir al is giving his diagnosis of the Ummah. These people, إِنَّ الْقَوْمْ خَافُوكَ عَلَىٰ دُنْيَاهُمْ وَخِفْتَهُمْ عَلَىٰ دِينِكَ And you was afraid of them because of your faith. فَتْرُكْ فِي أَيْدِيهِمْ مَا خَافُوكَ عَلَىٰ Leave for them what they are afraid of. 
وَحْرُبْ مِنْهُمْ بِمَا خِفْتَهُمْ عَلَيْهِ And run away from them for what you are afraid of from them, for your faith. فَمَا أَحْوَجَهُمْ إِلَى مَا مَنَعْتَهُمْ How needy they are to what you have withdrawn from them. And how needless you are from what they have prevented from you. And tomorrow you will realize who is the one who has taken the benefit, who is the winner and who is the loser. And then he says something from the Quran. لَوْ أَنَّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرَضِينَ كَانَتَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدٍ رَتْقًا ثُمَّ اتَّقَ اللَّهُ لَجَعَلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ مِنْهُمَا مَخْرَجًا In Surah Talaq, verse number 3, he says, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهُ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا Verse number 2, and then continuation in verse number 3, وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسَبْ وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهُ فَهُوَ عَسْبُهُ Whoever places trust on God, Allah would make a leeway, an escaping way for him or for her. Whether in rezq or especially, especially, this is what is mentioned about Abadar, in times of confusion. So it's very recommended that people recite this, these two half verses after every salah three times. Especially in terms of time of confusion, Allah would make escape way for people towards guidance by the blessing of this verse. It says, even if the whole, whole heavens and earth are tight and a person has taqwa, Allah will open them for him or for her. So, Abu Zar, this companion, is banished because of his criticism. What was his criticism? We will somehow analyze further, inshallah, later. But the point is, the picture Amirul Mu'minin, the honest tongue is giving, is not a very beautiful picture. It's not what was expected from Muslims. And therefore, it is not quite unexpected or not very surprising if we see that Muslims come together and kill Hussein alayhi salam. Everyone knows it's wrong and no one talks against it. No one objects against it. However, this incident brought some Muslims to their minds. You have heard after Imam Hussein came the Tawwabun, others, and many, many lessons were learned from the incident. The sacrifice of Hussein alayhi salam did not go waste and was not left unrewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those who have compassion for Hussein alayhi salam, inshallah. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi ta'iri. Thank you very much, Sheikh. We now have some time for questions. Um, before I move on to the questions, I'd just like to um, remind you all that Sheikh Bahmanpur will be continuing his tafsir classes on Sunday mornings. Um, tomorrow, the program will begin at 6.30 with Fajr Salah, followed by um, Quran recitation and breakfast. And then the tafsir classes, inshallah, will begin at 8 o'clock. Are there any questions? Sheikh, assalamu alaikum, thank you. Um, we know the famous uh, uh, way Hazrat Ibrahim communicated uh, with Allah, uh, that is uh, the dream that he had, uh, on which uh, the Prophet had no doubt. Now, what other ways uh, was uh, Hazrat Ibrahim communicating? Uh, when we relate uh, to the, our Prophet, uh, we know that Jibreel was uh, coming uh, with the ayat and instructions. So what were the ways that Hazrat Ibrahim was communicating with him? And then how, why was he, how, how sure was he that this, this, the communication that he was getting is, was from Allah? Well, just like our Prophet, he, Jibreel came to him. And sometimes it was dream, just like our Prophet as well sometimes 
dreams came as revelation to him. Maybe not revelation of the Quran, but other types of revelation. So, because prophets have different ways to receive revelation. One way was through the dream that Ibrahim mentioned. Other ways through mediation of angels, which is of course mainly Jibreel. And then through media without mediation of angels as well, which is uh, of course very difficult and that's why it doesn't happen usually for prophets, except in very exceptional cases. So the same sort of revelation was coming to Ibrahim as well. Any questions on the lady side? Sheikh, uh, you raised a very interesting point about the the chain of transmission in Najul Balagha. Now, I whenever I have a discussion with my Sunni brothers, friends, uh, I struggle to come up with evidence of the chain. Could you suggest me the book or any of which I can really evidence, you know, give proper evidence that this chain is actually a true chain, so that they can be convinced? Actually, most of these traditions, because Sharif al razi has taken this from other books, so most of them are found in other books. There are uh, books written on Esnad of Nahjul Balagha, and uh, actually some uh, versions of Nahjul Balagha, uh, some editions, uh, some prints of Nahjul Balagha, they have the, the books which have similar traditions there. Uh, and uh, for example, for one khutbah or for one letter, several books are mentioned that this can be found in those books as well. We cannot find the chains of Sharif al-Razi because he, he was not concerned about the chain. He was concerned about eloquence. And actually he saw the proof of these statements to be from Ali, peace be on him, the eloquence of the statements, which was unparalleled with any other uh, statement from uh, Arabic literature. So he didn't actually uh, was concerned about the chain, and somehow he was collecting these for himself. And then, of course, he decided to publish it. Uh, but as I said, there are editions of Natural Balagha which mention all other books in which these traditions are mentioned. Now, this one which I mentioned, it is reported in Al-Kafi with chain of transmission. It's reported, as I said, uh, in, in, in Johari has reported it from Abdul Razak Sanani, uh, the Sahib al Musannaf, from uh, Ikrama, from Abdullah ibn Abbas. So these chains can, could be found here and there. Related question, Sheikh. Very small. Uh, Ibn Hadid, he was a Sunni scholar, right? Yes. Okay. Is there another Sunni scholar? I mean, who has got a list of compilations of uh, Amir Mu'minin's khutbas or letters? No. Ibn Amr Hadid has written a commentary on Nahjul Balagha. Uh, also, Ibn Maysam has written a commentary on Nahjul Balagha. And uh, uh, maybe Ibn Abul Hadith was, was very interested in this because of the eloquence as well. Uh, of course, there are things in Nahjul Balagha which uh, uh, somehow is against what Ibn Abul Hadith himself believed. And that's why, for example, in many instances, he says that our Shu have said this about this statement, and I'll, I asked my sheikh about such a statement, which is quite clearly uh, laid out in his Sharh of Nahjul Balagh. Any questions from the lady's side? Asalaamu As Alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum uh, uh, You mentioned earlier on um, the verses to recite in times of confusion. Um, forgive me if I missed if you said, actually said them, but could you it's the last them? part of the verse number two of Surah Talaq and verse number three. Okay. Alaykum um, Salaam. There's a lot of 
سلام علیکم شیخ محمد علیکم السلام ویز ریگارد او انالایزین او او توکن بعد این ده اعمال و اخلاق و خلافای راشدین is my humble opinion that as a weak Muslim, I don't really want to get into judging them or analyzing them, but I know that I cannot be quiet for what happened in Karbala anymore, and you know I can understand now what is haq and what is not haq, and haq was definitely with Imam Hussein, so I do definitely do bayat with Imam Hussein, but when you said that, who do we follow? There is no doubt in my mind that um, I'm uh, um, an Ahlul Bayt of Rasulullah are the definitely the, but the best role models for me, and I should, I should learn from their ways of life. But who do we follow? I think the best, the best people that who can, we can follow are mentioned in the Qisas of Qur'ani, the stories of Qur'an. We can learn, you know, sabr um, uh, from Ayyub alayhi salam, you know, uh, and qalb salim from Ibrahim, and Toba from Yunus, and so on, and it just continues, and all the, how we can, you know, learn is from them. And um, that's the safest way for me. I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but uh, that's, that's, that's how I think. And also, I think that what the sad story I heard with the brother there saying that Wahhabis are killing Shias, I think the best way of, if he had said, sadly, Muslims are killing Muslims in Syria, it would have a, a much bigger effect, a much bigger message to say that you're all brothers in Islam, and sadly are, you know, the, the followers of Ahl al-Bayt are being killed and oppressed in, in Syria, instead of saying Shias, saying Muslims are killing Muslims, is, is, that's, that's much, much sadder, I think. So I thought I'd mention that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very good. Other any questions on the lady's yeah, side? Yeah, alaikum. Um, I had a question um, about Nahjul Balagha Sermon 79, um, where the Imam is speaking about women, and I was wondering if you could explain the tone and the context of what's being said, because from an outsider's perspective who doesn't have much understanding, they would probably think that um, you know, it's sort of defaming women, saying that they're not intelligent, not capable. Um, so can you ex explain that? I think if we, if we want to have a short answer or very short s summary discussion about it, we cannot uh, analyze, give it actually the, uh, the full analysis which it deserves. And because it's a very sensitive issue, and it's mentioned in Nahjul Balagha, and it's not only in Nahjul Balagha, of course, in many other books, the same things are mentioned. So I think we need a full discussion about it. So if you allow me, we leave this for a full session. I don't know when that will come. Maybe the organizers, inshallah, will, uh, will make a full session on that. It's not only that. We have, for example, the verse number uh, 34 of Surah Nisa which is very controversial as well. So I think we have to bring all these together and then discuss them together to see what conclusion we will get about it, inshallah. Thank you very much, Sheikh. I think we'll end there. Salawat. Okay, thank you.